the wolf, one of the most successful, adaptable animals on the planet. Highly intelligent, powerful, sociable. Skills that allowed it to become one of the most widespread predators on Earth. But despite their strengths, they're no match for man. For hundreds of years, humans have relentlessly persecuted the wolf, and the killing continues today. Struggling from the brink of extinction, this top predator claws its way back, reclaiming lost ground. Thanks to the efforts of people, the wolf is once again conquering the world, and hopes are high for the return of the global wolf. The global wolf is pursued not only by hunters, but by biologists as well. A handful of dedicated wolf researchers scattered across the world, battling to ensure the future of the wolf. Fighting centuries of wolf hatred, but slowly, each in their own way, winning the battle for the species. Doug Smith encouraged the return of the wolf back to Yellowstone in the heart of North America in a famous wolf reintroduction. In Europe, Giza Klute is hoping that rumors are true and that after decades of absence, wolves are finally making a comeback. She is hot on the trail of these new arrivals. Canadian scientist David Jones is using caribou to get to wolves in the Yukon Territory. He studies the relationships between predators and is waiting to see what will happen when two great hunters come face to face. Vladimir Bologov is truly on the front line, saving wolves directly from the hunter's guns. In his native Russia, wolf hatred means he must work hard to ensure their future. These dedicated few are the only real hope, but with their passion and the wolves' ability to survive, they are making a slow but steady change. The story starts in Europe, in a land where hundreds of years of killing have prevented wolves from making a comeback. Wolves haven't lived here, in Germany, for 150 years. The western border between Germany and Poland. A border guard on night watch. Deployment of high-tech machinery reveals strangers in the darkness. An intruder, someone or something, is invading the border. The infrared cameras reveal an animal, a canine, wolf-like head. It's dismissed as a dog. The River Oder lies less than 70 kilometers from Berlin, the capital city, an unlikely place to find wolves. Not far from the capital, Giza Klut winds her way through the forest, but she's being watched. The attack. But there seem to be smiling faces on both sides. Giza is a wolf biologist, and these captive animals are her friends. Wolves tend to be very friendly among themselves and to any people that they know, people that they like. They show unbelievable friendliness and exuberance. Early spring 2001, rumors persist of a wolf pack. They seem to have found a battlefield on which to stake their claim. A military training area next to the Polish border. Wolf expert Giza is called in to confirm or dismiss the stories. Years of fieldwork tracking wolves through the forests of Eastern Europe have primed her for this mission. But can she find them? If wolves did cross the border, they would be able to live here. They would find plenty to eat, and there are enough inaccessible areas where they could retreat. The area is populated, but not in such a way that it would cause any problems for the wolves. Absolutely 
On the other side of the world, another wolf hunt is getting underway. The wilderness of Yukon, Canada, the site of an annual caribou migration. Every year, great herds cross the Porcupine River, and every year the herds attract wolves, and wolves attract wolf researchers. Biologist Dave Jones has joined his friend Stephen Frost of the Gwich'ing, or Wolf Tribe. The Porcupine River gives them access to this vast territory in their search for wolves. For several years, Dave has been studying the interactions between predators and prey. The caribou cross in this area? Another 16 miles. Stephen knows the trails of the caribou like the back of his hand. For 20,000 years, the lives of his people have been intimately woven with the migrating caribou. For them, like the predators waiting on the banks, the deer have always represented an important source of food. It's a great time of year with all the birds coming through, isn't it? The Porcupine River snakes through prime wildlife habitat, from southeast to northwest, where it joins the Great Yukon. It's the end of May, and the migration is still underway. But so far, no sign of the herds. The men settled down for their first night, unaware that they were being watched. Although current estimates suggest 50 to 60,000 wolves inhabit Canada, they are very hard to see, reclusive, shy, and run quickly when spotted. Under the cover of darkness, they make their presence known. Like the men, the wolves are awaiting the migration. For Dave and Steve, it gives hope of things to come. After the lion, the wolf was the most successful and widespread carnivore in the world. During its 15 million year evolution, it was able to conquer almost all of the northern hemisphere, from the frozen tundra to the forests of Asia. India, one of the most densely populated countries on Earth. More than one billion people live here, almost 320 people per square kilometer. Yet despite the crowding and poverty, the people have maintained a special relationship with the wild. Some species are welcome to live alongside humans, such as the langurs or holy monkeys that thrive in the heart of the community. India's rich natural history has inspired many stories. Perhaps the most famous, Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book. A favorite of children across the world, The Jungle Book tells of Mowgli, a boy befriended by the animals, an orphan abandoned in the forest, but adopted and reared by a pack of wolves. Even today, children are found in the forest and are believed by many to have been reared by wolves. There is another side to the wolf's personality. And in India, there are some accounts of wolves killing children. Some can be dismissed as fanciful stories, but a handful have been authenticated wolf attacks. The wolf of India is slim, rangy looking. A short coat, big ears and long legs increase heat loss in the tropical climate. Kipling's vultures were more welcoming than this, but the squabbles don't disturb the wolves. One of the traits that makes the global wolf successful is the close bonds that form between individual members of the pack. It's a character found in wolves throughout their range. This pair could be together for life. Wolves have a complex communication system. A wide variety of howls, barks and yaps are enhanced with body language such as friendly tail wagging. Because of the pressures of land loss, the wolves of India have become rare. Only two to three thousand remain. Often considered forest animals, Middle Eastern wolves have conquered even the toughest of deserts, Sinai, Egypt. The 
desert appears a vast and barren moonscape, but life abounds. Mountain desert specialists like the Nubian ibex thrive in the harshest of environments, picking their way across the rocks. Wolves. The presence of herds of big game is likely to attract predator attention. By day, the plant eaters feed on the grass high in the mountains. Safer here, they can easily spot approaching danger. The males, hoping to attract females, show off their strength by clashing their enormous meter-long horns while maintaining a foothold on the craggy slopes. At dawn, the animals must make their way to lower ground in search of water. Small springs create an oasis where all animals can quench their thirst. The wolf knows that sooner or later all will be forced to drink. And when they do, she will be ready to greet them. All she has to do is wait. A mountain gazelle, another drinker, spots the approaching hunter and barks a warning to the herd. But for one youngster, it was too late. Part of the secret of the global wolf's success, to adapt to new situations and exploit every opportunity for an easy meal. Wolves have dominated the Israeli landscape for thousands of years. But 140,000 years ago, there was a big change. The first modern humans appeared in Eurasia. Wolves never conquered Africa. And so Israel is probably where these two top predators met for the first time. This region was one of the first places where people gave up their nomadic lifestyles and began tending the land, farming crops and breeding domestic animals. Here, for the first time, people had a real reason to hate the wolf. These wolves seem more interested in harassing the sheep without serious intent. Perhaps they've recently eaten. But they can and do kill livestock. And for that, they have become hated. Even in biblical times, the wolf had become a symbol of evil. It marked the start of a great battle between humans and wolves that was to last for thousands of years. Back in Canada, Dave Jones and Stephen Frost continue their search. So far, no sign of caribou or wolves. Not a, not a very big bear, was she? No, that's... Uh, Tracks found on the stream bed turn out to belong to a family of grizzly bears. It's an exciting discovery, but their mission is to find wolves, so the journey continues. Uh, that's not a very really big grizzly. No. Dave hopes his research will reveal more about the lives of wolves in this region and their relationship with other predators. They're known to feed on caribou and raise their pups during the caribou migration, maximizing opportunities to hunt. But he wants to discover whether they follow the herds or stay here year round and where they choose to rear their young. Steve has spotted something. That Cliff over there, you see. A wolf. As usual, it turns to run off. They land the boat to get a better look. 
Dave expects the wolf to disappear into the forest, but it doesn't. It turns and howls. Then, to his amazement, it moves closer. Dave decides to try something. And the wolf responds. The way the wolf really seemed to be communicating with me as I howled to it, it was truly uh, a wonderful experience to be able to, to see the wolf and to howl to it and, and spend time with it and actually feel like there's a connection between us as humans and this animal in the wild. A truly unique event. Wolves usually hide if they see people, and even experienced wolf researchers have rarely witnessed an incident where a wolf responded to a howl in sight of people. It's puzzling behavior. Usually wolves call to unite the pack or warn off intruders. What is the meaning of this encounter? That wolf would have to stand so close to the river. To the, river here, right? the wolf is close to a hole. Could it be a den? Could the wolf be howling because they've stumbled into the heart of the pack's home range? The encounter lasts for more than three hours. On the other side of the Atlantic, Giza is trying her hand at a bit of wolf calling, still hoping to find wolves on her home ground. Wolf researchers call to try and locate wolves at night, when the wolves can't see them. Howling is central to the wolves' social organization, keeping the family in contact or providing gossip on the neighbors. If a wolf hears the call, or even a human imitation of it, it is compelled to respond. If there are wolves here, and they're certainly not as obliging as in Canada. It's been a disappointing night, and her fears grow that the extermination of wolves 150 years ago was final. The demise of the wolf began way back in the Middle Ages. From the retreat of the last Great Ice Age, much of Europe was covered in thick forest, which provided food and shelter for a variety of big game. Plant eaters such as bison and red deer browsed on the trees, and they in turn were preyed upon by a variety of hunters. Among the predators at the top of the food chain was the wolf and Neolithic man. At that time, people were hunter-gatherers, feeding on what they could find in the forest. Wolf and man were competitors, but for the most part stayed out of each other's way. But things were to change. After the collapse of the Roman Empire in the fourth century, religion began to enforce ideas, and the wolf's reputation diminished. The time of Karl de Grosse, 400 years later, saw the first organized wolf hunts in Germany. People wanted to bring nature under control and began to enjoy the thrill of the chase. An age of sport hunting had begun. Many species were wiped out. Eventually, the pressures of hunting and loss of game animals for food became too much. The German wolf was pushed to the brink of extinction. The native landscape was converted to pasture, 
patrolled by farmers wanting to protect their livestock. Wherever wolves remained, their need for food brought conflict with people. They were relentlessly killed. It was a great battle that removed the wolf from most of Europe, a battle that the wolf could not win. In more recent times, the hatred continued. In a typical example from 1948, a wolf was spotted in the fields of northern Germany, but it was far from welcomed. Watchtowers were quickly set up, and hunters waited day and night for the chance to kill it. Even at this time, the hunters were hailed as heroes, and the celebrations were even filmed for posterity. Since then, wolves have tried to establish themselves in Germany, but everyone has been shot before it could settle. It was the same story across the globe. Wherever wolves and people met, the wolf was attacked. The global wolf was reduced to a tiny fraction of its former population, and the hunt goes on. Russia, a vast wilderness, and the last great stronghold for the wolf. Most of the world's remaining wolves live here, around 35,000 animals. Life here can be tough. Vladimir Bologov is after wolves. But he's not the only one. In Vladimir's home, hunts like this happen almost every day. Strings of flags are set around wolf dens. The waving cloths create a psychological barrier that the wolves are afraid to cross. Russian wolves are given no protection, and the hunt is never ending. 14,000 are killed every year. A bounty is paid for each one, 35 euros. For a hunter, this could be a month's salary. To them, the only good wolf is a dead one. After the devastation of World War II, the Russian population had little time to hunt, a reprieve for wolves. Unfortunately, people saw the increase of wolves against their own impoverished state as a sign that the wolves were taking from them, fueling their hatred. The wolf became the enemy of the state. The spoils of a successful hunt, orphaned, captured after their parents were destroyed. Often, pups like this are killed. But today, the hunter has the chance to make some money. Vladimir wants to buy the orphaned pups. He takes the puppies to a remote island where there are no people. But there are wolves. Vladimir has established a wolf pack on the island, all once orphans that he has bought from hunters. He unloads the frightened new arrivals, a tense time for everyone. Wolves do not always accept strangers into their pack. To reduce the risk, he introduces the pups to a lone female. Vladimir hopes that the adult will not only tolerate the orphans, but adopt them. Living as part of the pack will give them the best possible chance of surviving to adulthood. Later, the babies are introduced to the rest of the pack, and with their foster sibling by their side, they go unharmed. To wolves, as humans, the sight of a baby can evoke strong paternal instincts. The pups will quickly settle into their new home. The wolves are used to Vladimir, but he tries hard to limit his contact with them. He aims to keep them as wild as possible. During their first few weeks of life, wolf pups will imprint on their parents or providers. Vladimir will back off and leave the older wolves to raise the pups.
Once members of the island pack reach their first birthdays, it's time for Vladimir to return them to the wild. To maximize the chances for the chosen animals, he drives far from civilization, deep into the vast woodland wilderness of Russia. He must find a site with no people, livestock, or other wolves. Once in a suitable site, he hopes that the pair will breed and begin a pack of their own. Radio collars are used to enable Vladimir to monitor the released wolves. On the island, the wolves have caught some small prey animals themselves but they must learn to hunt bigger game. He stays with them for several days, safeguarding his friends while they find their feet. But he will not feed them, knowing that eventually, hunger will drive them to hunt for themselves. It's tough for both Vladimir and the wolves. He must say goodbye, and hopes that the release site is remote enough to keep hunters at bay while the wolves must learn to adapt to life on their own, without their human guardian. Vladimir's wish is that one day, the people of Russia will begin to accept the wolf, as they have in other parts of the world, and that his rescue will no longer be necessary. Finally, after several days, the wolves depart into the night. Vladimir won't see them again. One week after their dramatic encounter on the Porcupine River, Stephen Frost, member of the Gwich'ing tribe, is still puzzling over the howling wolf. He's part of a local community known as the Wolf Clan. For centuries, they've seen the wolf as a brother and have kept it in the highest regard. He watches the den. A white wolf. And like the first one, she doesn't show any fear. She forages on the riverbank and seems to retrieve some food. Wolves, like other dogs, often bury spare food to be recovered later, another of their special survival strategies. Her activities afford Stephen the opportunity to enjoy a rare chance to watch the wild wolf. She starts to heave. Stephen at once knows what this means. She's regurgitating food. She has pups. With such young puppies in her care, this wolf clearly isn't migrating. For the first few months, wolf pups stay in and around their den. They must be a resident pack, no doubt waiting, like Stephen and the scientist Dave Frost, for the caribou to arrive. For now, they dream of the dramas to come. Back in Germany, and a wolf mother and pups is something that Giza can only long for. Still no sign of the wolves, but the trail is hotting up. She's found an eyewitness, the forest warden, Roediger Preisner. The first time I saw wolves was about two or three years ago. There were two. Both totally grey. At the time, we thought they were just a poacher's dogs, but now we have become certain that they were wolves. Giza finds it hard to believe that there could be more than one wolf in the area and doubles her efforts to find out. The military zone is laced with sandy roads. If wolves are here, the soft soil will tell the tale. <laughs> then suddenly, success a trail. The tracker accompanying her asks if she is certain, but she's in no doubt. It's the track of a wolf. 
<laughs> Wonderful news for Giza. It seems that the German wolf is back. From Germany to Romania, the home of Dracula. The origin of dark fairy tales of murderous beasts that roam through the night. The ancient forests of the Carpathian Mountains are largely unspoilt and home to most of the 3,000 or so wolves in Romania. Like Dracula himself, the local wolf researchers must travel at night. Led by Christoph Promberger, the team are hot on the trail of the local wolves, close to the city of Brazov. Laws preventing the use of certain traps and poisons had given Romanian wolves protection from hunters. But a change of government has led to concerns that the wolf will once again be under threat. The team hope to use their knowledge to reduce the conflicts. Tonight, the researchers have stumbled upon the alpha male of the resident pack. Neither he nor his younger traveling companion has a collar, so they will be lost to the darkness. But the team have picked up a faint signal. It seems to be coming from the city itself. The signal identifies the animal, the alpha female known to them as Timish. Following the signals of Timish, the scientists find themselves on a very busy road leading to the city center. It's a surprise to find such a timid animal venturing into noisy, crowded suburbia. They spot the alpha male again. Even he is unusually close to people. But the female signal leads them even further to the heart of the city. An animal rummaging through garbage, a bear. It seems extraordinary to see such a big and potentially dangerous animal in a city. But in Romania, a bear raiding the rubbish bins is a common sight. Like the wolves, the bears are a worry to conservationists. Officially, they are protected. But in towns, they're a real nuisance, and hunting continues despite the laws. The first signs of daylight. The hunt goes on. The city is just starting to come to life. People gather at the bus stop ready to head for work. A faint signal suggests that Timish is on the move. Suddenly, she appears, out in the open in broad daylight. She runs with confidence, as though she has traveled this path many times before. For over an hour, the researchers give chase. The chase pays off. She has eight pups. Life here obviously suits her. The den is just two kilometers from the heart of the city. There are eight youngsters, an unusually large litter, evidence that a good living can be made close to human settlements. The success of this family proves that given the chance, wolves can adapt and live alongside people. Their ability to eat just about anything makes them among the most adaptable animals, one of the few that can cope in a man-made environment. The alpha pair will rear the pups with help from other members of the pack. Those that reach maturity will someday set out to find new homes, perhaps conquering new ground. It was in this way that the species became the global wolf. For their first few months, the pups will receive care and affection from the older members of the pack, who provide warmth, shelter, and food. Even their rough and tumbles are tolerated at this tender age. But as they grow, their relationship with the other dogs will change. As the pups mature, they play fight more and more. It's nothing serious, but already they're beginning to establish their own hierarchy. Gradually, as the youngsters' games become more boisterous, 
they find the attitudes of their kin less tolerant. Despite their submissive body language, there will come a time when they have simply outgrown the pack. Whether they like it or not, they will be forced to fly the nest and set up families of their own. Timish has proven that wolves do not need vast areas of wilderness to survive. Maybe the wolf really could return to the rest of Europe, crossing borders and expanding. The only problem in the face of their expansion is human fear. Only public education will allow the return of the global wolf. On the other side of the world, the problem faced by the global wolf has been fought and overcome. Yellowstone National Park. As in Europe, wolves were wiped out here. And today, they're making a comeback. But unlike the wolves of Europe, they needed a helping hand. Yellowstone was established as a refuge for the last 50 or so bison, the remnants of a 16 million strong population decimated by decades of hunting. To help preserve the last remaining herds, it was Yellowstone policy to remove the wolf. But the tables were to turn. Winter 1995, some 900 kilometers away, Canadian wolves are under attack. These wolves will run again, but now they sleep, anaesthetized to protect their captors while careful examination ensures their survival during a long journey to a new home. 14 wolves caught in Canada were transported to Yellowstone in the United States to start the foundations of a new pack. After decades of absence, the wolf was back. A plane flight, a lorry trip, and a sledge ride take the wolves deep into the wilderness. Initially, the animals were given the run of an enclosure while they acclimatized to their new surroundings. The new arrivals settled in quickly, and after a few weeks, were free to go. A black female was the first to leave, and nearly 10 years later, her son, wolf number 21, one of the first wolves to be born in the wild, is still the favorite of wolf biologist Doug Smith. Doug was at the forefront of their dramatic comeback. The success of the project exceeded expectations. Initially, other reintroductions were planned, but it soon became clear that the wolves could increase in number on their own. For Doug Smith, it was an opportunity to right some of the wrongs man had inflicted on the wolf. When European humans settled North America, they wanted to tame the wilderness, and that meant getting rid of the wolf. And I think that's sad, and I also think that that's unfair to treat other life forms that we share the planet with that way, because the goal was to kill every wolf. Resistance persists from some local farmers who opposed the reintroduction. They see the wolf as a threat to their livelihoods. It was anticipated that wolves would take some livestock. I'm sure they're going to kill a bunch of livestock. They're, they're an animal of, of opportunity. 50% of the local community objected, but a vast majority of the national public were behind the scheme. Wolves became heroes of conservation. Today, thousands flock to the park to glimpse the stars. Yeah. Yeah. We've got to deal with the public, and then the ranchers and farmers, which are a small part of the public, but they live with the wolves. That's the problem. A few people live with them, a lot of people want them. We've got to balance that, and that's where uh, it gets tough. Part of Doug's ongoing work is to prevent conflicts between wolves and locals. Yellowstone has become one of the best places in the world to watch wolves in the wild. Canada. From his lofty perch, the eagle has spotted something. The caribou are finally on the move.
Dave and Stephen arrive just as the first wave begin to make their crossing. This is what they've been waiting for. We were watching the interactions between the wolves and their closest competitor, the grizzly bears. And these two species, the wolves and the, and the grizzly bears, both at times during the year are very dependent upon the caribou herd. Dave already knows well that like the local people, the bears and wolves are dependent on the caribou herds, although they have a far lesser effect on caribou numbers. Of a population of around 130,000 caribou, around 10% are hunted by people, while only 3% are lost to wolves and bears. The predation doesn't threaten the herd's survival. Around 80,000 calves are born each year. The caribou follow a migration route established hundreds of years ago. Like the wildebeest of Kenya, they present an annual spectacle as they tackle every obstacle in their path. Even the strong currents and steep slopes don't halt their advances. Easy spot for wolves to get them. But the migration takes its toll. Young and old animals are exhausted by their march, and hungry eyes are always watching, looking for any sign of weakness. A group of stragglers are spotted in the shallows, and the wolves are quickly on the scene. It's the black wolf that makes the first move. using combined strength to bring the huge bull down. escaped, but there have been casualties on both sides. The caribou won't last for long. A day later, and the wolf pack have had their fill, and crows pick over the remains. Now trouble appears on the scene. Bears are fast and powerful, quite capable of bringing down a full-grown caribou on their own. But it's much easier to steal from others. The grizzly may weigh four or five times as much as the wolf, so it doesn't have any trouble in laying claim to the meal. We watch how the bears and the wolves would interact during the feeding of the caribou. We were very interested to find out exactly how then that their habitat would overlap with the use by humans. So a third, a third species in that mix. But the wolf doesn't go home empty-handed. Many wolf kills are lost to bears, but the advantages of pack hunting mean that the wolves can usually replace their meal. Giza is still watching the German landscape, still waiting for a glimpse of the wolf. Time and time again, she patrols the military zone, scouring the bush for signs of life. She regularly sees boar and deer. These are the favorite prey of wolves in other parts of Europe. Maybe they really could make a living here, 
settling to establish the first German pack in 150 years. Then finally, there it is. It's some way off, but she can see a wolf hunting a mouse in the long grass. The proof she has been searching for, a wolf back on German soil. Giza is overwhelmed. It's so exciting for me. I've been to Estonia to study them, many miles away. And now they're right here in Germany. They live right here. They seem to have settled down, maybe rear their young. I found droppings and tracks. It's great. <laughs> Further observations confirmed the pack had produced young of their own. The wolf was back. So it seems that the wolf is expanding its range. However, its future does lie in human hands. But there is a final twist in the tale of the global wolf. Wolves are everywhere, at least in one form. Around 14,000 years ago, people befriended the wolf, a relationship that was to give man his best friend. Today, the descendants of wolves sit in living rooms across the world. We have harnessed the power of the wolf, its stamina and strength, to help in the hunt. We use its intelligence and instincts to herd a farmer's livestock. Wolves have even turned drug detective. Sometimes it's hard to recognize the wild animal after thousands of years of selective breeding and a few hours in the doggy parlor but it's still in there. With our help, the wolf has conquered the world. Maybe human attitudes have changed, paving the way for a glorious future for the global wolf. But without the few dedicated individuals and their passion for wolves, it would not have been possible. Their efforts to win public support for the wolf have been central to wolf reintroduction. That's what Doug Smith does, showing visitors to Yellowstone the role of the wolf in completing this ancient ecosystem. Preparing people to welcome the arrival of wolves ensures their future success. Giza Klute never tires of dispelling the myths surrounding the wolf. The Russian Vladimir Bologov takes the hands-on approach to saving wolves and releasing orphaned pups. He uses his experience to teach students training the future task force to fight for wolf protection. And Dave Jones continues to travel the wilds of Yukon to reveal some of the secrets behind this most successful of predators. His unique encounter, a reminder that this ancient hunter is still surrounded by mystery. His message is that the wolf has become a symbol for all that is wild. If all the Gizas, Vladimirs, Christophs, Dugs and Daves of the world are successful in their mission, then maybe one day in the future, wolves and people can unite in a common goal to ensure the future of the global wolf. <laughs>